Be of a good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle, by God's grace, in England, as I trust shall never be put out. Hello everybody, this is David. Welcome back to my channel. This video is a continuation of our series, Martyrs for Jesus. And in this video, we're going to be looking at the Oxford Martyrs. And I've just quoted the last words of Hugh Latimer, who was burnt at the stake on October the 16th, 1555, along with Nicholas Ridley. Now, set into the road in front of Balliol College in Broad Street in Oxford is a cross made of different coloured cobblestones. This is what's called the Martyr's Cross and it marks the traditional place where the three Protestant bishops, Nicholas Ridley, Hugh Latimer and Thomas Cramner, were burned at the stake under Queen Mary, otherwise known as Bloody Mary, for refusing to renounce their Protestant faith. Now the Tudor period in England 500 years ago, 15, 1500s, was an era of religious turmoil prompted by Henry VIII's break from the Catholic Church. Now Henry's son Edward I continued his father's Protestant policies but when Edward died in 1553, his half-sister Mary came to the throne. Now Mary was a staunch Catholic and during her short and bloody reign, a high number of high-profile Protestants were put to death for refusing to renounce their beliefs. Now three of them were the men I've just mentioned. Three of the most prominent Protestant leaders were Hugh Latimer, who was the Bishop of Worcester, Nicholas Ridley, who was the Archbishop of London, and Tom Thomas Cramner, who was Archbishop of Canterbury. Let's look now at who these three men were. Let's start with Bishop Hugh Latimer. Now he was born, no one knows exactly when, but it's thought that he was born around 1487, sometime between 1480 and 1494, but it's thought he was born around 1487 AD to a farming family in Thurcaston, which is in Leicestershire. And he was educated at Clare College in the University of Cambridge and ordained as a priest in 1515. He, which is two years before the Protestant Reformation, by the way, he served as a university chaplain and preacher and became one of a dozen priests licensed by Cambridge University to preach anywhere in England. And he continued his studies until 1524 when he received a Bachelor of Divinity degree. Now, he was initially vehemently opposed to Protestantism, but after hearing the confessions of Thomas Bilney, he accepted the reforming philosophy and began to preach in favour of an English trans translation of the Bible. Now for this he was called to explain himself before Archbishop Wolsey. Now England at this time was essentially ruled by the Catholics and they had their own system and they didn't want the ordinary person to read the scriptures for themselves. Isn't that interesting? So he quickly became influenced by the radical writings of Martin Luther. He's the guy that in Germany that's, that nailed the 99 theses to the church door and essentially started the Reformation. Now, Latimer was called before Archbishop Wolsey to defend himself from accusations of Protestantism. He satisfied Wolsey, but his freedom of movement was curtailed. 
Now, when Wolseley died and was replaced by Thomas Cramner as Archbishop of Canterbury, Latimer was released and he continued to preach in favour of religious reform. And in 1535, he was named Bishop of Worcester. He openly opposed the Catholic doctrines of purgatory and the mass. But when he criticised the six articles of 1539, he was removed as Bishop of Worcester and thrown in prison. Now he was released and served for a time as the personal chaplain to Catherine Brandon, Duchess of Suffolk, but he found himself back in the Tower of London by 1546. So when Edward VI took the throne that year, Latimer was freed from the Tower of London and resumed his ministry. But when Mary took the throne, it was only a matter of time before Latimer's Protestant preachings caught up with him. Let's look now at uh, Bishop Nicholas Ridley. Now he was born in 1500 AD to a wealthy family in Tyneside in Northumberland. He was raised at Unthank Hall near Holtwhistle and was educated at Pembroke College, Cambridge University. Now on graduation he was ordained as a priest and went to the Sorbonne in Paris for further education before taking up the post of senior proctor at Cambridge University. Now in that post he was responsible for the university's resolution that the Pope had no more authority in England than any other foreign bishop. Now, in 1537, he became one of Archbishop Cramner's chaplains and from there, aided by Cramner's patronage, rose steadily through the ranks of the church, becoming Bishop of Rochester in 1547. Now, he was also one of Cramner's closest advisers and worked with him on the 1549 Book of Common Prayer. Now, in a strange twist, Ridley was forced by Cramner to appoint the reformer John Knox to the post of Vicar of All Hallows, which is in Bread Street in London. Now, when Edward VI died, Ridley supported the claims to the throne of Lady Jane Grey, and his signature appeared on the letters patent offering the throne to Grey. Now, on the 9th of July, Ridley affirmed publicly that Mary and her half-sister Elizabeth were illegitimate. So when Grey was overthrown and Mary took the, the throne, it was only a matter of time before she turned her anger on Ridley and other Protestant leaders. Let's look now at Archbishop Thomas Cramner. Now, he was born on the 2nd of July, 1489, in Aslockton in Northamptonshire. Now, he was the second son of a modest gentry family. Now, since as the second son he would not inherit the family estate, he embarked on a career in the church, and at the age of just 14, he was sent to Jesus College in Cambridge. So there he stayed for 11 years, eventually gaining a Master of Arts degree and becoming a Fellow in 1515. He married a woman we know only as Joan, which was technically allowed as he was not yet a priest, but it, that resulted in the loss of his fellowship at Jesus College. So his wife unfortunately died during childbirth and Jesus College once more accepted Cramner as a Fellow. Now, he was ordained as a priest in 1520 and a doctor of divinity in 1526. So he was selected by Cardinal Wolsey as an ambassador to the Holy Roman Emperor in Spain. Now, from 1527, he was one of several scholars called upon by Cardinal Wolsey to argue for the annulment of Henry VIII's marriage with Catherine of Aragon. 
So Cramner, he actually suggested calling upon university theologians throughout Europe to support the king's um, bid for annulment. So it was during this process that Cramner first became exposed to the humanist philosophies of religious reform that were then sweeping Europe. So in 1532, he was again an ambassador to the Holy Roman Emperor. And it was during his time on the continent, that is Europe, that he met and married his second wife, Margaret, we don't know her maiden name. So contemporary records are not clear, but it seems that until clerical celibacy was established in England in 1539, he lived openly with his wife. Now, he was named Archbishop of Canterbury in 1532 under the patronage of the Boleyn family. Recognise that name? He responded by organising the legal process by which Henry's marriage to Catherine was declared null and Cramner personally crowned Anne Boleyn as queen on the 1st of June, 1533. He was later named as godparent of Anne's daughter, the future Elizabeth I. So interestingly, uh, he was known as a reformer. Now as, as Archbishop of Canterbury, he gradually moved the church towards reform against the wishes of many of his bishops. Now, when Anne Boleyn was accused of adultery by Henry, Henry VIII, this is of course, Cramner was one of the few to support her cause, and he heard her confession at the Tower of London three days before her execution. So, the clergy in the main, what's known as um, conservative, they basically the guys that stuck to the rules, denounced Cramner, but the king continued his support and Cramner gradually introduced more reforming policies. So he was one of the executors of Henry's will and helped ensure that Edward Seymour was named as Lord Protector during Edward VI's minority. So in 1549, Cramner introduced the Book of Common Prayer, the controversial document that laid out a reforming vision for the new English church. He reformed canon law and published the 42 Articles, a revised statement of Anglican doctrine. So Cramner must have known that when Mary took the throne in 1553, he would be in danger. But, unlike many religious reformers, he chose to stay in England. On the 14th of September, he was sent to the Tower of London to await trial for treason. So the trial took place on the 13th of November, and he was found guilty and sentenced to death. So let's look now at uh, the trial of the bishops. So on the 8th of March 1554, the Privy Council ordered Ridley, Latimer and Cramner to be taken to the Bacardo prison in Oxford to await trial for heresy. Now they were kept in the prison for 17 months before their trials began and the city of Oxford had to bear the cost of keeping them, fed and watered, you know, clothed them fed. Now the cost of supplying the faggots, which is the part of the fire used to burn Archbishop Cramner, were charged to his expense account, when, which the city tried unsuccessfully to claim back from the Archbishop of Canterbury. Can you believe that? Isn't, isn't that incredible? So Cramner was tried first, while Ridley and Latimer were tried together. Now I've actually been in the room where they were tried. Now in the case of Ridley and Latimer, the verdicts were very quick. They were sentenced to be burned at the stake. The trials were held at the Church of St Mary the Virgin in Oxford, 
which is actually a very beautiful church building and you can there if you go there you can still see a notch made in one of the nave columns where it was cut away to create the wooden platform from which they were judged now all three were found guilty because they refused to accept transubstantiation which is the process by which the wine and bread offered during communion becomes the blood and body of Christ. Now we all know that Christ died once for all. The Catholic in the Catholic Mass, they he is essentially re-sacrificed every time they hold communion. So it's a blasphemy, which they weren't willing to be a part of. So the execution then, let's look at the execution. On the 16th of October 1555, Bishops Latimer and Cramner, sorry, Latimer and Ridley were burned at the stake while Cramner was forced to watch from the Tower of Bacardo Prison, which stood beside St Michael at the Northgate Church on Core Market. Now I've been to that church, it's a beautiful church. Uh, I used to do some ministry there to the homeless. So the two men stood back to back at the stake and the last words uttered by Latimer have been recorded as, as I said at the start of the video, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. Now, Cramner, interestingly enough, was not executed with the other two because he was given leave to appeal his sentence. Now, unfortunately, in 1556, he caved into pressure and submitted to the Roman Catholic Church, affirming papal supremacy and accepting transubstantiation. It was the first of four recantations he was to offer. Now let me just stop here a moment. Can we judge the man? What would our position be if we were in danger of losing our lives? If we'd already seen what our possible fate could be. He'd already witnessed the burning at the stake. The horrific death of the other two. Can we blame him? It's an interesting question, I think. Now, let's continue. Even though he had essentially recanted of his Protestantism, Mary was determined to punish him who she, because she saw him as the architect of her father's break from Rome. Now, on the 26th of February, he again renounced Protestantism and on the 9th of March, and on the 18th of March. Now, despite his, this repeated gestures, it must have been obvious to him that the end was near, that he wasn't going to get out of this alive. Now, under canon law, he should have been absolved after recanting his Protestant views. But Mary was determined to make an example of him and insisted on his education, execution, sorry. Now on 21st of March, Cramner was brought to St Mary's Church where he was told he could make a final recantation. He prepared a speech affirming his Catholic faith and submitted it in advance. However, when at the pulpit, he cast his, he cast it aside and vehemently affirmed his Protestant faith, denied his renunciation and called the Pope Christ's enemy and Antichrist with all his false doctrines. He got his strength back. God gave him his strength back. Isn't that amazing? So he was led from the church to his place of execution on Broad Street, the same place he had watched Bishops Latimer and Ridley die from his prison tower. As the flames rose, oh, this is just incredible what happened here. He extended his right hand 
which he had used to sign his recantation of Protestantism so that it might be burned first. That's just incredible. He was so disappointed in himself, probably, that he had done it, that he wanted to remove all trace of it, even at his death. Isn't that incredible? So, in the apparently, the, the flames um, from the fire scorched a set of doors which are now hung between the quads of Balliol College. I haven't been to Balliol College, so I must go and have a look one day. So in the aftermath of, of his death, the authorities published all six of recantations with no mention of his final act of defiance. Isn't that interesting? Fake news. However, the true event, what actually happened, was soon public knowledge. So why were they executed? They were executed because they refused to deny the truth of the gospel that jesus is the only way of salvation that his sacrifice was once and for all and his body and blood were enough once it was a once time one only time sacrifice so they were very courageous men, but it's very interesting actually. There is a um, memorial to them, probably less than 100 metres, just around the corner uh, from the actual spot where they were burnt. Now it's interesting, the history of this actual monument. In 1833, so 500, 300 years later and 200 years ago, thereabouts, 150 years ago, a man called John Henry Newman, who lived between 1801 to 90, he was an Anglican priest, but he began publishing a series of pamphlets called Tracts for the Times. Now, what he wanted to do, essentially, was to bring the Anglican Church back in to the fold of the Catholic Church. He he was followed by somebody called John Keeble, E.B. Pusey, in, and they cited what's called the Oxford Movement. And now some critics saw this as a drift back to Roman Catholicism. In fact, it was. So by 1838, the Oxford Movement was in full swing, and some more, um, some. Uh, vigorous opposition to that um, who were concerned about the powerful tug of the Oxford movements. Th they commissioned the Martyrs Memorial in remembrance of the death of the three of the English Reformations, most well-known and fascinating heroes. I'll mention their names again, Archbishop Thomas Cramner, Bishop Hugh Latimer, and Bishop Nicholas Ridley. So that, that, that memorial was built as a reaction to the idea that essentially these men's deaths were in vain, which they weren't. They were making a stand for the truth of the gospel and they were willing they were willing, it must have been terrible for them, they were, they were willing to, to die for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as have been so many martyrs down throughout history. They have, they have not been willing to deny the truth of Christ. So it's, a, it's an incredible story, the three of them, but the martyrs' memorial itself, again is an incredible story it's it's a it's a picture as it were in stone or a memorial in stone that the gospel is not to be denied or messed about with that the truth is the truth is the truth and you cannot change 
the truth and God will always have his men and his women to stand for the truth. So I want to thank you for joining me in this video about the Oxford Martyrs. Oxford is my home city and uh, I see the Oxford um, Memorial regularly and I've stood on the spot of the actual cross of the actual place where they were martyred and I've been in the room where they were tried. So God bless you and may you find the courage to not deny Jesus yourself if you ever find yourself in that position. May you stand strong, ask the Lord to help you and he surely will as he did with these three bishops. God bless you and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.